Coming up on today's episode of Airborne Unlimited, GAL reports aircraft fuel taxes are going to highways. A 40-year speed record is celebrated. The Dream Chaser moves towards flight. Hello, I'm Christopher C. Odom. It's August 12, 2016, and this is Airborne Unlimited. Are truckers really using jet aviation fuel to avoid paying taxes? A government accountability office report published this week determined that as a result of the unfounded presumption that truckers are cheating the system between $1 billion and $2 billion has been improperly held back from the airport and airway trust fund and diverted to the highway trust fund. The GAO report determined that any uses of aviation fuel in ground vehicles over the past decade have been rare and that both economic and technological disincentives further restrict the likelihood of such diversions taking place today. The National Business Aircraft Association said the report validates long-standing concerns expressed by NBAA and other groups about the validity of a so-called fuel fraud provision on aviation taxes. NBAA Chief Operating Officer Steve Brown said, after an extensive and unbiased investigation process, the GAO's findings validate our brief that the current system is fundamentally flawed and not structurally aligned with the intent of either the highway or aviation trust funds. It's hard to believe that any record in aviation could hold for 40 years, but 1976 was a different time. The Cold War with the Soviet Union was in full swing and Americans were standing in line to buy gas. That year was also the country's bicentennial birthday. To celebrate, officials decided to attempt to break some records with an aircraft known as the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. On July 28, 1976, retired Major General Eldon Jorges, the pilot and retired Lieutenant Colonel George Morgan, the reconnaissance systems officer, set the world absolute speed record for jet-powered airplanes with a speed of 2,193 miles per hour. Jorges said, We never dreamed, I guess we never gave it much thought, how long the record would last. Today, that plane sits in the Robbins Air Force Base Museum of Aviation, and for three days, the museum hosted Juarez and Morgan and 12 other crew members and pilots who were part of the SR-71 program. About 300 people also visited the museum July 30th for a public event commemorating the 40-year anniversary of the record-setting flight. After the break, the Dream Tracer heads to Edwards Air Force Base. There's a difference between charting a steady course and pushing for the ceiling. And for nearly a century, Hartzell Propeller has been defining that difference. It's in our passion for engineering and research and our dedication to testing the limits of performance. We are built on honor. We are Hartzell Propeller. Concorde's recombinant gas RG series sealed battery technology produces a high performance battery with the advantages of being pre-tested and fully charged at the factory. Find out more about Concorde's entire line of batteries at www.concordbattery.com. Concorde, the heart of your aircraft. Welcome back. If you'd like to be a supporter of Airborne Unlimited, send an email to jim at aero-news.net. It looks like a smaller version of the space shuttle is coming nearer to flying. Sierra Nevada Corporation's Dream Chaser full-scale flight test vehicle is ready for transporting to NASA's Armstrong Flight Research Center in California, where Phase 2 flight tests will be conducted in coordination with Edwards Air Force Base. Upon arrival at Edwards, the company will begin a series of pre-flight ground evaluations to verify and validate the vehicle's system and subsystem designs. After successful completion of all ground testing, Dream Chaser will begin its phase two free flight testing. The vehicle will undergo a series of tests building on those performed in phase one, including tow tests, pre-flight test, and ending with free flight testing. Along with other pre-flight and post-flight evaluations, this data will be used to confirm Dream Chaser's subsonic aerodynamic properties as well as flight software and control system performance requirements. 
The flight test will act as a bridge between previous work with NASA's commercial crew program and the next generation vehicle currently under development for the forthcoming International Space Station cargo resupply missions. It's Friday, and that means it's time for a and CAO and Editor-in-Chief Jim Campbell to check in with his weekly barnstorming commentary. And Jim's barnstorming today, it looks like he has finally caught his breath from all the work at Air Venture 2016, and he's ready to talk about the highs and lows at Oshkosh this year. Here's this week's barnstorming. Thanks, Chris, and hi, folks. Well, we survived another Oshkosh. God help me, my 44th. And the interesting thing is, as many times as I've journeyed to Oshkosh with great expectations, they've been met or exceeded virtually every time. I can't think of an Oshkosh ever that was a disappointment outside of a few floods and a few acts of God weather-wise here and there. This year, there was some criticality that it be a good year. Last year, Oshkosh showed that it was alive and that sport aviation and general aviation was alive and it needed to show it again and from frankly from here on out it needs to keep showing it but this year it did it's up one percent which may not be much by some standards but up is good especially in aviation and more important than anything else the overall health well-being and look of Oshkosh it was good we saw more families we saw more diversity we saw a tremendous amount of sales activity and we had good reports from vendors there were some very exciting events uh, the Martin Mars drops were phenomenal the snowbirds were as always phenomenal and take my word for it having flown with these guys they're among the best if not the best in formation teams in all the world and they keep proving it and through number of iterations. And above and beyond all that, there were World War I flybys, the Innovation Center, uh, the drone cage, the fact that EAA has made a strong statement about inclusion. A lot of GA doesn't like the drones, but the drones are there. Everything's there. Everything that flies and is trying to put its best foot forward in aviation is part of Oshkosh, and that's a good thing indeed. We're a little disappointed with the uh, Statements by the administrator, once again, they insist on bureaucracies. I cannot believe that Flying Magazine has given Icon yet another editor's choice. I don't know what they're thinking or what they're smoking, but it can't be good. Uh, at the same time, I was a little disappointed in watching AOPA and Garmin try to put together their STC program without any respect or, or due process or thanks to the fact that EAA pioneered this with Dynon uh, and this bit about one-upsmanship and having to own it all, well, that's just wrong, and AOPA has been doing that for a while. I'm a little disappointed in them. But overall, great event, great things. Um, and on a personal note, my wife had a ball. She's really getting into photography, and some of the photographs she took this year were outstanding, the kind of stuff that I wasn't able to do for years and years and years, and frankly, there's some photos in there I'm pretty envious of. Oshkosh is a great thing for the entire family. And in the case of my wife, Masako, she has a ball. And isn't that a great thing? She looks forward to it every year. And I guarantee you, for as long as I can make my way out there, she'll be right by my side. What a great thought and a great feeling. Oshkosh is, after all, in so many ways, about families. The family of aviators, our own families, the families of friends and the people we respect and admire and want to see year after year after year. Yeah, that's Oshkosh. For the Air News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell, and we'll get back to business next week. But for now, still got the Oshkosh buzz. After these messages, an SAIB has been issued regarding 737 Stabilizer de Eisen. Redbird Flight Simulations is dedicated to revolutionizing flight training by designing, manufacturing, and delivering affordable and innovative flight training technologies. Each Redbird device is designed to enhance the training experience for pilots of all levels, from student to ATP. Redbird is quickly becoming the industry standard for flight training. Since Redbird introduced its revolutionary FMX in 2007, colleges, universities, and flight training operations around the world have integrated Redbird products into their curriculum. It's time to discover what Redbird can do for you. Join the migration. Sandia introduces the new SAI 340 Quattro TSO'd airspeed, attitude, altitude, and slip. With integral backup battery, safety never looked so good. See it now at www.sandia.aero. 
The aviation industry is full of news, and we're summarizing a few of those other great stories in a brief segment we call Around the Patch. It looks like innovation begets more innovation as drones enter more use. A startup company is helping operators of small UAVs satisfy the FAA's requirements for insurance. They're offering per flight by the hour policies purchased using an app on their mobile devices. The FAA has issued a special airworthiness information bulletin concerning de-icing procedures on certain models of the Boeing 737. The bulletin was prompted by reports of a model 737-800 airplane encountering an uncommanded pitch-up event after intercepting the glide slope. A forecast international report said an estimated 4,791 medium and heavy military rotorcraft will be produced from 2016 through 2025. The yearly production is predicted to decline, according to the report, through most of the 10-year forecast period. An engineering change proposal for KC-46A, mission planning under the Mobility Air Force's delivery order on the Air Force's Mission Planning Enterprise contract, has been awarded to the engineering firm DCS. The contract provides aircraft mission planning for systems for the Air Force, Navy, and Marines. The fourth annual Safety Showdown event of the North Texas Business Aviation Association is set for August 31st and September 1st. It has now been approved by the National Business Aviation Association to be a Certified Aviation Manager accredited program. Well, that's it for today's trip around the patch. Now, let's get back to the rest of the news. Three World War II veterans of the legendary American volunteer group, Flying Tigers, will share their fascinating experiences and stories at the Atlanta Warbird Weekend. Dinner with the Tigers on September 24th and the 57th Fighter Group Restaurant, located on the DeKalb Peachtree Airport in Georgia. Speakers at Dinner with the Tigers include Frank Lazanowski, a 3rd Squadron crew chief, who was also the president of the American Volunteer Group Flying Tigers Association, and Association Vice President Chuck Baisden, a 3rd Squadron armorer. Also speaking will be Dr. Carl Brown, who was the 1st Squadron flight leader. This year, the Atlanta Warbird Weekend is celebrating the 75th anniversary of the AVG Flying Tigers. Over the weekend, the event will host the largest gathering of Curtis P-40 Warhawks in 50 years of at least one of the historic planes anticipated to show up. The third annual Atlanta Warbird Weekend, which is a community effort led by Commemorative Air Force Dixie Wing, will feature numerous World War II aircraft on display and flying. Well, that's our program for today. Remember that Airborne Unlimited is streamed Monday through Friday with additional breaking news bulletins for important stories that fall outside of our normal deadlines. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe and do check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Keep flying. We'll see you on Monday.